this morning, Tom? Um, yeah, it's just y'all and us. Okay. All right. Well, in that case, what we're going to do, Jason stepped out for a minute, but the um, goal today is to finish up this uh, Unit 1. We're going to look at the, uh, the video that, that Dr. Weaver has on, on that um, um, that unit, and he's talking about federal laws and regulations that affect uh, pesticide use. So um, we're going we're, we're gonna to get started on that. Uh, I think that's about a 50-minute um, video, and uh, there's a lot of stuff. There is a lot of stuff. And, and I apologize, in years past, Dr. Weaver has been somewhat of a monotone type presentation so uh, you know if you need to pinch yourself every little bit stay awake please do um, but it, it's it's I can't affect it or adjust it um, it's just sort of his nature in his presentation so I hope he's revised this one a little bit from from past years but but I will know here in just a little bit so if you don't have any problems or questions with that we're gonna get started with it and try to try to wrap it up All right. No lab in this class. No lab in, in either act or I mean the plan or no. Welcome to Federal Laws and Regulations. Presented by Dr. Michael Weaver, Professor and Director of the Virginia Tech Pesticide Program and adapted from Applying Pesticides Correctly, Private Applicator Supplement, Unit 5. Now here's Mike Weaver to discuss the federal laws and regulations affecting pesticide use. The federal agencies that are most often associated with pesticide laws, regulations, and the programs that, that are associated with uh, with enforcement of these laws and regulations include the U.S. Environmental Protection we Agency, can't see it, John. the Food and Drug Administration, or the FDA, the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, or OSHA, the U.S. Department of Agriculture, or USDA, and the U.S. Department of Transportation. Again, there are other agencies out there that uh, have interaction with with uh, restrictions and regulation of pesticide use. So you may see other names and information come up in your activities, daily activities dealing with pesticides. But these are the major uh, agencies that you should be uh, aware of. They each has their own specific responsibilities for different pesticide laws, regulations, and programs associated with them. The first pesticide law in the United States, the Federal Insecticide Act, was enacted in 1910. It was designed to protect consumers from ineffective and deceptive pesticide labeling. This law was enforced until 1947 when the Federal Insecticide, Fungicide, and Rodenticide Act, or FIFRA, was passed. FIFRA set new procedures for registering pesticides with the USDA at that point in time and has established uh, labeling provisions. In its initial years, FIFRA primarily addressed the efficacy of pesticides rather than regulating pesticide use. Since 1947, FIFRA has had several significant amendments. In 1972, FIFRA was amended by the Federal Environmental Pesticide Control Act, or FEPCA. At that same time, the responsibility for regulating pesticides was transferred from the USDA to the EPA. These changes authorized the EPA to strengthen the registration process by requiring the chemical manufacturer to meet registration standards. It also allowed the EPA to enforce compliance with laws that prohibit the use of banned and unregistered products and to promulgate the uh, regulatory framework missing from the original law. In its current form, FIFRA mandates that the EPA regulate the use and sale of pesticides to protect human health and preserve the environment. FIFRA gives the EPA the authority to register pesticide, classify pesticides for general use or restricted use, require applicators to be certified to purchase or use restricted use pesticides. Regulate the pesticide label and every activity a pesticide applicator conducts that is associated with the label and labeling can oversee the sale and use of pesticides. However, because FIFRA does not fully preempt the states or local law, the state government may also regulate pesticide use. A very important part of FIFRA is the labeling and the, uh, the registration of pesticides. And pesticides can be registered in various ways. Uh, some of the labels that you see uh, on a daily basis uh, usually fall under, under uh, the registration of new pesticides, and these are registered under uh, particular sections of the law. Uh, in terms of FIFRA, Section 3, for example, uh, is used to register uh, most new pesticides. But there are other sections of the law that uh, govern other types of registrations, and these include uh, experimental use permits, 
uh, emergency use exemptions, and sometimes these sections are actually used to describe the particular label. In the case of emergency use exemptions, it's sometimes called Section 18 uh, registrations. A state-specific registrations, which sometimes are called Section 24 Cs, or, or state, state, state local needs, SLNs. And then there's even a group of registrations that are, are actually exempt group of uh, pesticides that are minimal uh, risk pesticides that are exempt under FIFRA. And this is a, these are Section 25B pesticides. EPA uh, weighs the benefits and the risks of uh, particular uh, pesticides being registered. And that's how a lot of the uh, decisions are made on how uh, these <coughs> registrations come about. So that's very important. Uh, the other issue is that uh, the one area that the certified applicator often sees and is, is of course, uh, restricted or enforced on using or not using particular digital pesticides because of the uh, requirement that they must comply with the law and because of the requirement that they must be certified are the restricted use pesticides. And this is labeling that uh, you'll see specific on the labels. Uh, the, the, these restricted group of pesticides are pesticides that have been deemed hazardous even when used correction. So the restricted use pesticides will be clearly labeled as such, and the label will state the reason uh, why they're classified as restricted And this could be uh, some hazard to, to humans, whether it's the applicator or the bystander. It could be a hazard to the environment, whether it be water quality or uh, wildlife, some other type of non-target species. But it's important to know that uh, the restricted use pesticides uh, are only uh, permitted to be used by trained and certified applicators, and those applicators are either private or commercial applicators. We mentioned the words private and commercial applicator. Well, how are they defined? Well, a certified private applicator is an applicator that uses or supervises the use of any restricted use pesticide in the production of an agricultural commodity. Applications must be made on the property owned or rented by the user or his or her employer. If they're not, if they're used on, say, a uh, property of another person, then they must be used without compensation other than trading and personal services between producers of agricultural commodities. Non-certified applicators employed by agricultural producers may use restricted use pesticides, but only when working under the direct supervision of a certified private applicant. A certified commercial applicator under the federal law is any person using a restricted use pesticide or, or trying to purchase a restricted use pesticide for any purpose on the job other than what we described for a private applicator. And this can involve anyone who is uh, working for, say, a government entity uh, who might be giving advice or actually applying pesticides for that government entity. Uh, it might involve someone who decides that they have a, would like to have a business that their sole purpose would be to go out and apply pesticides for hire. And so if you're a lawn care operator or a pest control operator, say treating for termites, cockroaches, or anything of that nature, uh, then you're considered a commercial applicator. Uh, same thing with uh, someone who would be working, say, for a golf course or uh, for some other uh, organization or, or uh, agency or, or uh, company who would be applying pesticides on the property of that, of that company but not necessarily be uh, hired by someone else. Uh, if that operation doesn't fall under the, the definition of a private applicator, then uh, you would be considered a commercial applicator as well. So this varies back and forth. And in some states, uh, for example, in Virginia, it doesn't matter whether you use restricted use pesticides or not. Uh, you're considered a commercial applicator if you use general use or restricted use in, in particular states. That's under that state's law. But based on the federal law, uh, the key to a commercial applicator would be whether or not you would either purchase or use uh, restricted use pesticides. The pesticide applicator is required to meet certain competency standards under the federal law, and they're also required to meet the same competency standards in, in their uh, state of, uh, of operation. You can live in one state and apply pesticides in another state, but you have to adhere to the regulations in the state in which you're doing the work. So you must be trained to use restricted use pesticides and meet certain competency standards set by the state. The state is compatible with the federal laws, uh, and the state set these requirements for initial certification, for recertification, for licensing fees, insurance requirements, and then basically those requirements, in addition to the federal requirements, work hand in hand to uh, pretty much allow applicators to use restricted use pesticides, but 
also enforce the federal and the state rules uh, somewhat seamlessly together uh, to uh, govern pesticide use in a particular area. You might run into some other terminology as far as applicators, particularly in the area of uh, non-certified applicators and the rules governing non-certified applicators. For example, non-certified farm workers can apply restricted use pesticides under the direct supervision of a certified private applicator, and in some states, registered technicians can apply general use pesticides without supervision, and restricted use, use pesticides only under the supervision of a certified commercial applicator. So the terminology, uh, farm worker, handler, uh, can come up, and some of this is specific uh, terminology dealing with the type of application, and particularly when we talk about work protection standard, that is uh, something that uh, is used in that terminology. Registered technicians uh, are generally used to describe an applicator who is a uh, commercial applicator, but not fully certified as a commercial applicator. So an individual who renders services similar to a certified applicator, a uh, certified commercial applicator. And that person uh, usually has completed training and, and demonstrated competency uh, required specifically for registered technicians, but not the full competency or requirements for commercial certification. And again, this can vary from state to state. Uh, some states have this uh, requirement and uh, the means to certify or to designate street registered technicians, others don't. Uh, for, for example, in Virginia, we have a registered technician uh, category. There are a number of other rules and regulations that are governed by EPA. One example would be one that you'd never see, but it would uh, relate to registration. Uh, the Pesticide Registration Improvement Act, or uh, PRIA, uh, which was passed in 2003 to establish pesticide registration service fees or registration actions uh, in three EPA registration divisions. And that particular rule uh, impacts the cost of uh, registration to the applicator uh, indirectly. It, it impacts the cost to registering a pesticide, for example, uh, for the companies that, that do register pesticides. But the applicator would never see this type of, of rule directly and not have to comply with it. And there are a number of those, as we go through here, we may mention. Uh, however, uh, they do uh, function in such a way that, that they will be part of the nuts and bolts of the whole process. So you should be a little bit aware of them. One rule that certainly isn't in the background when it comes to uh, pesticide regulation, at least in the agricultural community, is the work protection standard. And WPS was initially uh, implemented in 1974 as somewhat of an abbreviated uh, rule, an attempt to protect the worker, and there were restrictions on entry into a treated area and so on and so forth. But in 1992, it was reissued uh, by the EPA to protect workers and pesticide handlers from exposure to agricultural pesticides, and the goal being the risk of pesticide poisoning and injury. Uh, WPS covers pesticides with general use and restricted use pesticides that are used in the production of agricultural plants on farms and forests in nurseries and greenhouses. Uh, it requires employees or employers to take steps to reduce the risk of pesticide related illness and injury if they or the people they employ use pesticides or are potentially exposed to pesticides or pesticide residues. And the size of the operation is an key issue here. Uh, it can involve a family farm. It can involve a large oper larger operation. If the individuals or businesses uh, have meet some of the criteria uh, that we described, then they must provide their employees with uh, information about exposure to pesticides, and that might involve uh, somewhat abbreviated pesticide safety training. It also has to be offered in the language of the worker so that they understand it. Uh, those employers have to display pesticide safety posters in the location of medical facilities. They have to provide access to label information, including health and safety information. They have to provide access to a list of pesticide treatments made on the work site. Uh, they also have to provide protections against exposure, and that might involve protecting or prohibiting pesticide handlers from applying pesticide in a way that will expose workers or other persons, excluding workers and handlers from areas being treated with pesticides, excluding workers and handlers from areas that remain under a restricted entry interval or with some narrow exceptions there, uh, protecting early entry workers and handlers who are doing permitted tasks in treated areas during the restricted entry interval, including training on the correct use of personal protective equipment, notifying workers and handlers about treated areas by posting those treated areas, either uh, that or giving oral warnings or both, depending on what the label says, uh, so they can avoid accidental exposure.
uh, protecting pesticide handlers during handling tasks, including training on the correct use of PPE for subjective equipment. And then it groups provide ways to mitigate pesticide exposure. So uh, they must provide decontamination sites to provide pesticide handlers and workers with enough water soap and single-use towels for routine washing and emergency decontamination. And emergency assistance in the event of an overexposure, including transportation uh, to a medical facility and the information uh, on emergency personnel, uh, information uh, that emergency personnel would need to treat for the pesticide uh, uh, exposure. So the labels are the key to this, and they they drive the whole process. And so we'll we'll talk about that here next. The work protection standard is somewhat unique. And it is a rule that uh, requires pesticide labels to have a certain amount of information on them regarding the work protection standard. Technically, the rule is part of FIFRA, and in labeling pesticides, it requires that pesticide labels have a directive, a, a use requirement box uh, for each compliant label. So in labels that are to be compliant, that would be labels that would be involved in, in agriculture, you'll have primarily an agriculture use requirement box on the label. In the case of, of labels that um, are not compliant or don't need to comply, and these could be labels that have both agriculture use requirements and non ag uses on the same label, you'll see a separate box that says non-agricultural use requirements on, on that particular label. In terms of the types of personal protective equipment to wear, these directives on the label will be very specific to what the applicator is required to wear, uh, whether it be for WPS use or whether it be for non-WPS use. And the applicator has to pay attention to this. The one issue that's unique uh, with the labeling on work protection standard compliant labels is that not, only, not all the information is there. And so the applicator is directed to what we call a separate reference it's somewhat label by reference is what we use in the terminology here. And so the applicator, the user is directed to a manual called the How to Comply Manual. And in that How to Comply Manual, it has all the details of how to comply with the work protection standard. So you would obtain uh, your initial information uh, as far as the application information on the label. It would still be intact, but additional information would be uh, available elsewhere in order to allow you to comply and follow all the guidelines of WPS. This particular rule, the Endangered Species Act, is one that uh, is somewhat of a hybridized rule. Uh, it's, it's implemented, and you'll see um, the enforcement issue uh, directing through EPA, but the other agencies involved with this are the Department of Interior Fish and Wildlife Service. Uh, and this is, as I said, a somewhat of a hybridized rule that uh, directs EPA to make sure that applicators uh, use pesticides in a way that they don't harm endangered and threatened species. Uh, so you may see uh, on the label, and this goes back to what we mentioned with WPS, language that is somewhat label by reference, where the applicator has to possibly seek help from another source in addition to the label information in order to uh, be able to or uh, follow the directions or the requirements on the label. Uh, and it may mean that you can apply pesticides in a particular geographical area. The main issue here is that the Endangered Species Act, uh, when it's been enforced in the past, has been uh, a very um, noted issue with those who violated it because it has involved large fines, sometimes jail time for violators. And that, in addition to FIFR restrictions and violation uh, impact violation, primarily monetary fines, uh, can be a, a major thing that could put you out of business very quickly and possibly wind you what you could wind up in, in prison. Hmm. We've talked about several different rules here uh, dealing with human health. We've talked about uh, protecting of endangered species and wildlife, and now we're going to shift gears again to a rule that protects water quality. Several rules actually protect our water quality. Pesticides are part of this whole big picture in trying to protect water quality. There's been a huge thrust in implementing water quality education into pesticide safety education. And for the applicator, the changes in labeling that have occurred and will continue to occur in this respect are things that uh, somewhat 
come down the line as a result of some of these so-called background laws that you don't always see and don't always know about, but they're there to protect the public. So the Safe Drinking Water Act is the main federal law that ensures the quality of Americans' drinking water. It deals with water at the tap. So anything that comes out of the tap, whether it's from surface water or groundwater, this rule protects it. And it sets standards for drinking water quality. It oversees the states, the localities, the water suppliers who implement those standards. The violation of this particular rule uh, is something that is very serious. And you as an applicator, if you're using pesticides and you happen to contaminate a water supply, this is the rule that, that would be implemented to come after you to, to find you or possibly involve uh, putting you in jail. One of those other rules that works in tandem with the uh, Safe Drinking Water Act is the Clean Water Act. It's technically called the Federal Water Pollution Control Act, but in the jargon, CWA, Clean Water Act, is the terminology you may see more often. And the Clean Water Act uh, works to restore and maintain the chemical, physical, and biological integrity of our nation's waters by preventing point and non-point source pollution. And these are types of pollution, uh, point source being pollution that we would identify coming from a particular identifiable uh, source versus non-point source pollution, which would be something that might not be easily identified as a particular source. It may be uh, some contaminant that's originated somewhere, but then the way it gets into water isn't easily uh, traced down to the source. It provides uh, assistance to publicly owned water treatment uh, facilities, for example, for improvement of water, wastewater treatment, and it also is aimed to maintain the integrity of our wetlands. Another law that falls into the jurisdiction of the Environmental Protection Agency to enforce is the Coastal Zone Management Act, uh, which encourages, encourages the states and tribes to preserve, protect, to develop, and where possible, restore and enhance valuable natural coastal resources such as wetlands, floodplains, estuaries, beaches, dunes, barrier islands, and coral reefs, as well as the fish and wildlife that habitat those areas. So it's a rule that's somewhat limited to where you might be located, and if you're an applicator, a pesticide applicator in those areas, uh, obviously in a coastal zone area, uh, then this is a particular rule that may be working in the background to uh, require you to comply in a certain way uh, in your act daily activities, whether it's on, in an agricultural situation or otherwise. Now we're going to talk about dealing with waste and one of the rules that's associated with this, the primary rule associated with waste, is the Resource Conservation Recovery Act, which is enforced by EPA. It's been in the books since 1976, and its primary goals are to protect human health and the environment from potential hazards of waste disposal, to conserve energy and natural resources, and to reduce the amount of waste generated, and to ensure that waste are managed, managed in an environmentally sound manner. Now, what is a hazardous waste? Uh, while FIFRA provides EPA with the authority to regulate the storage and disposal of pesticides in their containers, RECRA, or the Resource Conservation Recovery Act, may regulate some discarded pesticides in non-empty pesticide containers if they're considered hazardous waste. The pesticide is considered a hazardous waste if it's listed by RECRA or if it meets one or more characteristics. And these can include uh, whether it's ignitable or it burns readily, whether it's corrosive, Corrosive meaning that it can basically eat away something, whether it's your skin or whether it's metal or whatever it may be. Whether it's reactive, an example would be something that could explode. And so those are consideration issues under RECRA, and waste may be considered hazardous if it contains certain amounts of toxic chemicals. Now, the EPA identifies over 500 hazardous wastes, and they list them in certain ways. Uh, the commercial pesticides are listed as whether they're acutely hazardous commercial chemical products or toxic and other commercial chemical products. Pesticides and pesticide containers and pesticide residues are regulated under RECRA, and they can, inc they can include uh, discarded and unused pesticides, discarded pesticide residues or rinse aid for drums, tanks, or containers, non-empty pesticide containers, and pesticide residues that consist of contaminated soil, water, Another debris that results from the cleanup of a spill of pesticide. So, you as an applicator can generate hazardous waste. Regulations under RECRA vary, but they do have certain categories of, of waste generators. Those can be conditionally exempt set small quantity generators, 
They can be small quantity generators or large quantity generators. And small quantity generators include individuals and businesses that generate more than 100 kilograms of hazardous waste. So there's a variety of different uh, considerations. It gets into a lot of detail, and that's something that you need to do your homework on if you're in the, in the business and you're dealing with pesticide waste in your business, then you may have to deal with RECRA. Now, there's parts of RECRA that have certain exemptions. There's certain parts of RECRA that deal with something called the universal waste rule, and that rule is a special provision of RECRA that's designed to deal with farmers and other agricultural generators of pesticide waste. So there are some leniency under the rule that takes into account some common everyday activities. But there are points here that are important because in a business situation, if you fall into a particular category as a, uh, a waste generator, then you have a certain amount of time that you have to deal with that waste and you have to track what you dispose of uh, somewhat under what we call a, a tracking system. This rule is often uh, referred to as the cradle to grave waste rule because it, it tracks the waste from its source until it's disposed of. And that's very uh, uh, specific and it deals with moving the waste and transportation of the waste and that involves not just EPA but Department of Transportation and how you dispose of the waste uh, depends on what the waste is and, and what type of, not only chemical, but what it can be uh, used for or whether it can be reclaimed or whether it can be uh, used in a certain way after you get to a certain point where you consider it a waste. So you shouldn't be too anxious to consider things waste materials. You should be able to sort out the whole issue of how you generate your waste, how you deal with them, and plan so that you don't have a great deal of waste. And then the issue of handling your pesticides in a certain way so that when you generate waste or if you uh, generate chemical that you might be able to use in a certain way, you have a plan to deal with it so that you don't deal with record. Uh, as I mentioned, there's a universal waste rule that you have some uh, ability to deal with obsolete and banned substances, uh, things that are damaged and so on. It does ease the regulatory burden on, in certain respects on businesses that generate waste in a number of ways. And so it does streamline the process of this whole thing of notification, uh, prohibitions, time limits, employee training, response to releases, off-site shipments, and so on. But this is a very complicated area, something that you need to, again, do your homework on and be aware of before you get involved in, in being a waste generator. And most all applicators have some certain amount of waste that they do generate. Another rule that the EPA enforces uh, that deals with this whole issue of, of waste and how we deal with, with substances in the environment associated with chemical waste particularly uh, is uh, something you should be quite aware of, uh, perhaps not by its official name, and that's the Comprehensive Environmental Response Compensation and Liability Act, or CERCLA. Uh, but you would probably know this rule as the Superfund. It was enacted in 1980. Uh, it was the law created a tax on chemical and petroleum industries, and it provided uh, basically broad federal authority to respond directly to releases or threatened releases of hazardous, hazardous substances that may, may endanger public health or the environment. Uh, CERCLA uh, gives EPA the authority to clean up uncontrolled, abandoned, or known hazardous waste sites, and it has the authority to deal with accidents and other uncontrolled releases that put hazardous substances, such as pesticides, pollutants or other contaminants into the environment. Uh, they define a release as any spilling, leaking, emitting, discharging, injecting, escaping, leaching, dumping, or disposing of a particular hazardous substance into the environment. And CERCLA applies only when there is an imminent and substantial danger to the public health, welfare, or the environment. So, as an applicator with a 24-hour period, if you release a designated hazardous substance, substance into the environment, whether it's land, water, or air, at or above a specific reportable quantity, and this reportable quantity is listed in the law or in the regulations, uh, the reportable quantity includes a, a lot of uh, different chemicals, including many pesticides. And if you do that within that 24-hour period, then you are required by CERCLA to contact certain federal agencies and state agencies. That includes the National Response Center, which is part of uh, the Department of Transportation. Uh, it also includes your State Emergency Response Commission, 
and it includes your local emergency planning committee. Uh, and these are usually uh, local emergency response officials, such as the fire department. Uh, and you can obtain that information usually by contacting local authorities as to who to contact. So it's, it's a, uh, a rule that in, in terms of, of dealing with uh, waste, uh, it has a few exemptions. One of the exemptions is certain activities from uh, release notification, such as the application of pesticides registered under the fair uh, when these pesticides are used according to the label, and the storage and handling of registered pesticides by agricultural producers. Those are taken into account in this rule, but overall it deals with the waste issue and the release issue of, of pesticides, among other chemicals. In response to one international and, and a few uh, national incidents involving uh, re the release of, of uh, chemicals, uh, which did harm to uh, the public, in 1986, uh, Congress amended CERCLA to deal with this whole issue of uh, environmental hazards and safety hazards posed by storage and handling of toxic chemicals. The rule that they changed under CERCLA was called the Superfund Amendment and Reauthorization Act of 1986, or CERA Title III. The other terminology used was the Emergency Planning and Community Right to Know Act. And their concerns were triggered by a disaster in Bhopal, India, in which more than 2,000 people either died or suffered serious injury, including long-term uh, results of that, that incident even today. Uh, people are still suffering from that, that impact. The result of accidental release from a uh, pesticide processing plant there, uh, which was making an intermediate called methyl isocyanate that was eventually used to produce uh, pesticides. <laughs> and following that, there were a couple of incidents in the United States that were uh, somewhat scary and somewhat very much parallel to that, that same scenario or could have resulted in potential, uh, a potential impact similar to that. They didn't but there was certainly some major concerns by Congress, and so they, they passed uh, this amendment to impose new uh, requirements in both states and in these, in these facilities, to regulate these facilities. So the EPA is, in, is uh, charged to enforce this, and, and basically this rule requires that, that anyone that produces or stores hazardous chemicals to uh, provide communities with identity and the, the amounts of the chemicals located at their facility. And the law also addresses the need for communities to establish emergency response plans to follow in the event to, of a pesticide emergency or other chemical release. Uh, EPA has developed a list of extremely hazardous substances, each with a specific threshold planning quantity, uh, or a TPQ. So you hear, you hear a lot of terminology. We talked about RQ with CERCLA, uh, reportable quantity in, in releasing waste. And now this TPQ is another bit of terminology that's listed the law and that is something that basically requires that if you store or produce a chemical on the list the quantities that exceed this DPQ then you must uh, adhere to the requirements of Sarah Title 3 and that means you must submit, submit appropriate reports to your uh, uh, local authorities uh, and state authorities uh, both the, uh, the State uh, Department of Environmental Quality for example uh, your local emergency planning Committee, which is uh, somewhat in the same as the local emergency response committee, and local governments in um, in most states are required to establish the uh, local emergency planning committees to deal with reporting and notification under Sarah Title Three. The uh, the issue of of uh, a release here deals with this whole issue of storage primarily. As an applicator, if you store a, report, a, thresh, a, a material that exceeds the uh, threshold planning quantity in its concentrated form, then you do have to comply with this rule. Now, that's somewhat deceiving because uh, pesticides often are formulated and they're diluted even in their uh, end product form by a certain amount so that applicators can handle them a little bit more readily. So if you were to have a 10% concentrate of a particular material and the TPQ said that you had to a report if you had a pound of that that particular material, the active ingredient, then theoretically you, you would uh, the TPQ for that dilute ten percent would be more like ten pounds if you had a pound of it uh, at hand. So take into account the formulations that they're actually diluted uh, forms of the, what's listed on the TPQ. But again, uh, re regardless of whether you have to adhere or not, if you store chemicals uh, at all. You need to 
involve yourself with your local authorities uh, because this is an issue that comes back to your liability, it comes back to your reputation as an applicator, it comes back to having to deal and live in the community, and it comes back to the whole issue of just doing the right thing. Uh, if you're storing chemical, you probably need to uh, put together some type of a emergency, emergency response plan for your business. You need to train your employees to uh, deal with emergencies. And then you need to deal with the local authorities, and even to the extent of possibly involving them in your emergency plan, it, it really comes down to protecting yourself and your community and your family and knowing what to do in the case that you have to face a, a release, a fire, a leak, or what have you, some type of disaster. Uh, it's very, very important. And a walkthrough with your local authorities, with your local uh, emergency response group uh, can save a great deal of heartburn later on and can certainly help you uh, in your reputation within the community can actually enhance your business. So, uh, Sarah Title Three Emergency Planning and Community Right to Know Act, uh, it's certain, it's something that deals with your community and their right to know uh, what's being stored and potentially released within the community. Another background rule that you should be just vaguely familiar with, but it does affect you as an applicator indirectly, is the Toxic Substance Control Act, which was passed in 1976, and it gives EPA the ability to track over 75,000 industrial chemicals, including the active ingredients of many pesticides currently produced in the United States or imported into the U.S. The EPA repeatedly screens these chemicals, and it can ban the manufacture and import of any chemical that poses an unreasonable risk to the public and the environment under this rule. TESCA, or Toxic Substance Control Act, also allows the EPA to track thousands of new chemicals uh, developed each year if the chemicals have unknown or dangerous characteristics. And EPA can control these chemicals before they enter the marketplace as, as uh, necessary to protect human health and the environment. The Clean Air Act, which is enforced by the EPA, establishes criteria and standards for regulating toxic air pollutants to safeguard public health and the environment. The impact on pesticide application may involve the drift and release of pesticides into the air and the burning of pesticide containers and waste products. In addition to the Clean Air Act, in certain states, Open air on site burning of solid waste, including clean, empty pesticide containers, even if labeled, even if the label says it's an acceptable means of container disposal, is prohibited. The Federal Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act was originally passed in 1938 to ensure that foods, drugs, and cosmetics are secure and safe, and that all labeling and packaging on these products is truthful and informative. In 1954, FedCo was amended to require the establishment of a legal tolerance for residues of pesticides in food and feed. These tolerances protect consumers from potential exposure to excessive amounts of pesticides in food and feed. A tolerance is the maximum amount of a pesticide that EPA allows on a raw agricultural commodity. Presently, the EPA, FDA, and USDA cooperate in enforcing pesticide tolerances under FEDCO. EPA establishes tolerances for pesticide residues in raw ag agricultural commodities processed food during the registration process. Enforcement of these tolerances is the responsibility of the FDA and the USDA. One change in the law that impacted both FIFRA and FEDCA was in 1996, uh, Congress passed the Federal Food Quality Protection Act, or FQPA, and it set tougher safety standards for new and old pesticides, and it also uh, set more uniform requirements. Uh, and it took into account and resolved some of the inconsistencies in the federal pesticide statutes to basically change the way that EPA regulates pesticides. It actually took into account more sound science in, in both uh, FIFRA and FEDCA. And some of the major changes on the federal uh, Insecticide, Fungicide, and Rodenticide Act, FIFRA, involved uh, allowing EPA authority to provide emergency suspension on certain pesticide registrations, altering the re-registration process, uh, and that a lot, a lot of that dealt with uh, the assessment of, of the tolerances that we mentioned earlier. The pesticide process, as far as renewing uh, pesticide registrations, had been up in the air for quite some time, and this rule established a 15-year renewal cycle uh, for basically review and re-review of many of those materials. It put emphasis on registration of safer, uh, low-risk pesticides, reduced-risk pesticides, 
It also gave priority and some changes in the area of antimicrobial pesticides and gave some authority over to FDA that EPA had and allowed some of the uh, fine points here to be kind of fixed in a way. Uh, it enhanced incentives for the development and maintenance of minor use registrations in many ways. The new law establishes a uh, USDA revolving grant program and a program that supports uh, basically public health pesticides. And the reason for a lot of this is because on acreage nationally where there was crops growing less than 300,000 acres, uh, there wasn't a lot of incentive for manufacturers to maintain their registrations on these particular crops because there wasn't a lot of economic return for the cost of re-registering under these new standards. So there's been some incentives provided here to maintain products that can basically support pest management on these minor use crops. And when we say minor use crops, primarily we're talking about crops like vegetable crops, fruit crops, uh, not crops like corn or cotton or soybeans or small grains. The product registrations have been maintained pretty well on those crops because again, it falls into this issue of economics and, and what you can pretty much return on your investment. But it's, it's an issue that on many, many of the crops from the United States, it's, it's helped maintain pest management on those particular crops by this, this clause. And then to the Federal Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act, it changed the health-based safety standards for pesticide residues in food. And it allowed for a little bit more good science in this process because we had some clauses in that rule at one time that uh, were antiquated. They dated back to 1954. Uh, the science in the years after that in detecting residues and so on didn't make sense in, in terms of regulation. So this altered that in some way. It also took into account the size of the uh, of humans as far as our body weight and, and our, our development. So for infants and children, for example, uh, it allowed for a tenfold safety factor on certain food uh, and pesticide use on food so that uh, basically infants and children weren't getting the same dosage of, of material on uh, and allowed tolerances uh, or residues on these um, particular uh, certain crops as adults. So it took into account and provided more safeguards. It also had limitations on benefit considerations, which in the past we've, we've dealt with uh, registration of pesticides and benefits and risk. It somewhat limited that. It worked into this whole issue of tolerance reevaluation, you know, also mentioned the FIFRA issue. Uh, it provided more Formula tolerances, it dealt with uh, and addressed some of the concerns for certain types of hormonal effects, uh, what are termed endocrine disruptors, certain types of pesticides that might disrupt our endocrine systems. Uh, it provided uh, more enforcement uh, enhancements to allow uh, FQPA to deal with residue standards. And then it provided a right to know process for what food reached the shelf. So it provided uh, more ability for uh, the consumer to know what was being used on, on foods in their in the grocery store, so what appeared in the grocery store. So that's FQPA, a very complex rule, enforced by EPA, uh, enforced by FDA, uh, effect FIFRA and FEDCA, just a lot of things going on there, and, and a very significant rule, something you should remember. The Occupational Safety and Health Administration standards are regulations workers in the workplace. These rules cover a wide range of work situations, including employees who work with or are exposed to hazardous chemicals, for example, pesticides, in the workplace. Parts of these standards that are important to you uh, include emergency action and fire prevention plans, occupational health and environmental control, uh, for example, providing proper ventilation in storage buildings, handling mixing, storage, and disposal of hazardous materials, wearing proper protective uh, personal protective equipment, uh, providing general environmental controls such as signage uh, requirements as far as uh, rules and confined spaces, uh, medical services and fire and first aid, fire protection and fire control system requirements uh, in chemical storage areas would be a good example of that, machinery and machine guards, and toxic and hazardous substances. Uh, example, hazard communication requirements, occupational exposure to hazardous sub, uh, chemicals in the laboratories, and so on and so forth. So the occupational safety and health standards that are out there are enforced by the Occupational Safety and Health Administration. 
One of the OSHA standards that is critical to SI applicators is the Hazard Communication Standard, or HTS, or sometimes called HAZPOM. And it's enforced by the Occupational Safety and Health Administration. And various state agencies usually fall under the Department of Labor in one state or another. The HTS applies to all businesses, including farms, with employees that may be exposed to hazardous chemicals in the workplace under normal operating conditions or in foreseeable emergencies. Hazardous chemicals are substances that pose a physical hazard or a health hazard. These materials may include pesticides, fertilizers, fuels, lubricants, and other chemicals. The ACS requires the employer to identify and make a list of all hazardous chemicals in the workplace. It requires the employer to obtain and make available to employees material safety data sheets for all the hazardous substances on the list. It requires the employer to ensure that all can Containers of hazardous materials are labeled at all times. It requires the employer to train workers about hazardous substances, including information on the, on the standard itself, the hazards of chemicals in the workplace, protective measures against these chemicals, ways to detect the chemical release or personal exposure, and locations of safety information about the chemicals on site. And finally, depending on the numbers of employees, it, it requires the employer to prepare and implement a written HAZCOM plan and make it available to employees. This plan describes how the requirements for labels and other forms of warning, MSDS's employee information and training will be met at the facility. The federal law does not address uh, record keeping for most commercial applicators, but there is a federal law on the books that deals with private pesticide applicators. That's enforced by the USDA, and it's called the Food, Agriculture, Conservation, and Trade Act, or the FACT Act. Uh, also known as the 1990 Farm Bill. It requires certified uh, private pesticide applicators to record applications for restricted-use pesticides. And each restricted-use pesticide application made by a private applicator must be recorded within 14 days, and the records must be maintained for two years. And these records are subject to inspection by the USDA, and also they have a clause that basically allows for use of those records in the event of an emergency, such as a medical emergency. The FACT Act uh, also says that if a farmer hires a commercial applicator to apply a restricted use pesticide, the commercial applicator must provide the farmer with a record of the application within 30 days of treatment. The uh, HAZMAT rule, or basically these are regulations that are under the uh, jurisdiction of the Department of Transportation, regulates transporting of, of hazardous materials, hazardous substances, including pesticides. Uh, the 1994 Federal Hazardous Material Transportation Laws, the HAZMAT rule is known, uh, regulates uh, the shipment of by motor vehicle, rail, car, aircraft, or vessel of hazardous materials in commerce. And the Research and Special Programs Administration, the RSPA, is responsible for promulgating, uh, administering, enforcing, and interpreting hazardous materials regulation. And this office is, again, under the Department of Transportation. Uh, the HAZMAT applies only to hazardous materials, substances that, when transported, can pose an unreasonable risk to health, safety, and property. Uh, under HAZMAT, uh, the person offering or accepting the hazardous material for transport must be trained, in addition, before you can ship a material uh, within the U.S., including pesticides. You, the RSPA must determine whether it meets one or more of the DOT hazard classes. So there's a number of things going on in the background here, and when you see uh, hazard class uh, specifications on particular products and DOT uh, hazard labels. This is where this information comes from, including the placard that you see on many vehicles. And there's rules in here that deal with signage placarding that are somewhat related to international standards. They deal with more of the tanks and tank trucks uh, that contain substances. Uh, the rules are very complex. Uh, but the, the placarding is something you need to be familiar with. Um, there are exceptions, uh, particularly for uh, hazardous materials used in trade farming and by uh, some government employees. And these include materials uh, of, trade ex of trade exemption, farmer exemption, and uh, government employee exemptions that uh, relate to uh, certain uses. These are all part of the, of the rule itself. So it's, it's somewhat um, complex. There's a new component to it that relates to, um, to uh, security, particularly homeland security. And that uh, involves the requirement to have a security plan 
um, relating to transport. And the best advice to most pesticide applicators is to avoid transporting pesticides, to try to get them commercially delivered and not to transport a, a lot of pesticides, uh, particularly stock materials. Uh, but if you have to do this, uh, then you, you do have to comply with this rule and your employer is responsible for uh, implementing this rule and, and making sure that you're properly trained. And that, again, may involve special training, uh, certain restrictions, and certain signage. So the HAZMAT rule, um, we can talk all day on that issue, but just be familiar that it exists and it deals with uh, transportation and movement of, of uh, hazardous materials. And finally, uh, another rule that relates to uh, uh, enforcement by DOT is the Commercial Motor Vehicle Safety Act of 1986. And it was implemented to improve highway safety by ensuring that drivers of larger vehicles, trucks and buses primarily, are qualified to operate those vehicles and remove unsafe and unqualified drivers from the highways. Uh, the act retains the state's right to issue a driver's license, but it's established uh, with a minimum set of national standards, which states must adhere to when licensing um, drivers with commercial driver's licenses. The, the one issue, the one clause here that affects pesticide use, besides the size and weight of the vehicle, is that there is a hazardous uh, substance clause to the, uh, the CDL, to the commercial driver's license. And so in obtaining a commercial driver's license, you would obtain that for the size and the weight of the vehicle, which is also uh, an add-on uh, that you would obtain, which require further training and certification for um, substances that you might, you might be hauling would be of hazardous nature. This somewhat, somewhat uh, works in with the hazmat rule, but it's, it's a whole different uh, area as far as qualification of the driver themselves, but the hazmat rule somewhat targets the materials of being transported. This targets the driver. Uh, this driving these materials or moving uh, large equipment around. You have now reached the end of the lesson on federal laws and regulations affecting pesticide use. Thanks for listening. Tom, you back with us? Yes, we are. Okay. Um, after enduring that presentation, I hope that you guys can gain a little better understanding of why I hate acronyms. That was chock full of an assortment of acronyms and in all honesty it is a bit of overkill for me to expose that to you today but you needed to have an awareness of the, the scope and breadth of, of what we deal with um, in the application of pesticides. One thing across state lines requires so much stuff. It doesn't even have to be state lines. I mean, it just, that state lines complicated, but, you know. All right, I'm going to pose a question to you, you three of you at Southside. If you um, paid attention to that, do you think you could ever legally apply a pesticide and keep up with all the documentation and records that are needed? Probably yes. not. Yes. I mean, you have to. Yeah, make it, make it your job. You, you did. You did. But it's this was a bit of, you know, sort of overkill to give you all that at one time. All of as, you, as you use them and so forth, you'll be able to filter out some of that stuff. And, it, and a lot of it is encumbered in something else. So, you know, it, it is done every day. What, what time? This is my brain hurts. Well, I understand, and that's that's part of the reason I um, we're, we're talking about it now. But this is an example of the scope of which the, and the detail of which the federal laws apply to this stuff. They have everything covered you could ever imagine, and even things you couldn't. Well, and but I'll guarantee you, there's some exceptions that that, that would be covered. Also, I have a question regarding the head that law. It was saying stuff that poses an undue risk to the um, environment and public safety. Mm -hmm. Does that mean something that you just couldn't easily contain by throwing a mop or something at it? Uh, there are levels of that. But as an example of hazmat, 
uh, there was, we had a hazmat situation occur on 220 here uh, north of us about 30 days ago. A tanker, tractor trailer load of milk turned over and it was considered hazardous material. Hello. Because of the volume and the, the, the way that it was escaping from that truck. It was a hazardous material. Milk you. Mm -hmm. So, you know, as we talk about this stuff, volume and, and, and of substance being out of control or out of its location can can deter, can, 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 can be that. So you know, I'm not trying to, you know, scare you or anything about it, but, you know, uh, normal, normal agricultural use of stuff, have no problem at all. Uh, I, I put on three, four hundred gallon tanks of stuff at home last night, and I'm going to do two more today, just in an effort to try to control the diseases and rot of these grapes I've got hanging out there. Uh, but it's, uh, you know, and technically, you know, out of place, they will be considered hazardous material. But everything I used was also would be considered organic. So, you know, it's just, it's, it's something. Excuse me? If it's hazardous and organic, um, how does that work? Like, you don't have to um, get the uh, Nothing I used was, was of a restricted use nature. I was using it on my own farm. The hazard comes in when it's in its concentrated form. Oh. And uh, I was diluting the most. The, the, I was the most dangerous component that I had was was a, a, a compound called HDH proxy, or it's, another name is called oxidate. It's hydrogen dioxide. It's a, just one element short of being hydrogen peroxide, and um, it's an antibiotic. It's a bacterial type material that I will spray it on to produce rot organisms on the grapes. And in the diluted form, I was putting one gallon of, of the concentrated solution in 400 gallons of material, water. As a diluted, it's no problem at all. But if you get that raw active material on your fingers or skin, it burns like fire. It will actually take the, the epidermis and the upper layers of your skin off. It'll turn Turned as white as that notebook there in front of you. It's just caustic, oxidized. Boy. So that's, that's just an example. Yeah. I know they had said something through the slides about, um, I thought they said in the grocery store, when you go in the grocery store, uh, it, it doesn't show, does it show or tell you that these certain produce products like apples, or uh, squash, something like that, have been sprayed with a particular chemical because that's not this. Any, anything that you find in a retail grocery facility has been tested and found to be safe for human consumption. The federal laws and regulations have uh, safeguards built into them which are what we call a, a, a re-entry period or a tolerance, which would be another thing. And your, um, all of the chemicals have to be uh, past a, 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 certain, a certain tolerance and, and a level which make them safe for human consumption. And, and the majority of the stuff uh, is at such a diluted rate that it would never create an issue for you anyway. Yeah. Don't don't worry about anything that you get out of a grocery store. And most agricultural producers are concerned about selling you a product on a reoccurring basis. So they're not going to let you buy anything that has any potential hazard. And they don't want to accidentally kill you and have your family sue them either. Right. Yeah, we won't even go there. <laughs> yes. Well, I'm teaching a law class next, so I already went there. <laughs> All right. Uh, any other questions? You know, I'll be glad to, to, to help you. Kind of what we're trying to do with this is, is give you an idea of what is involved with this and 
and want to make it as simple as we possibly can. Okay? We've got Monday off. We'll start on Chapter 2 on Tuesday. So, talking about what we're going to do. Can't win. Is, yeah, whatever day we want to go. When we're supposed to come back. Good day. Y'all have a good holiday. Stay warm and dry. Hot and cool, whatever. Okay, bye.